At twilight, great flocks of birds disturb the reigning peace at the edge of the mangrove forests. The outer edge of this inhospitable ecosystem where the aquatic birds gather to eat is the best known and most tumultuous region of the mangrove forest. It is an open, exposed area where the birds can be easily seen, and so at first it was believed that the majority of the wildlife was concentrated here. But the impenetrable interior of the mangrove labyrinth hides shy, fascinating surprises. Cuba, like the rest of the Antilles, is a land dominated by lizards. Among the aerial roots, the shoots and the tops of the mangrove forest, thousands of them divide up the territory, marking it out and defending it with signals peculiar to each species. Each layer has its species, each individual its territory, each tree its owner. The Anolis are the most widespread genus with the greatest number of different species. On a high branch, a green Anolis lizard remains motionless, observing a ground lizard of the Leocephalus variety. The majority of species imitate the surroundings in which they live. Camouflage is vital to survival. Those that live on the branches and trunks are of brownish colors. Those that colonize the leaves are generally green, and those that live on the ground mimic the color of the dry leaves and the grasses. In the mangrove forest, only the movement of their courtships or a skin which has been shed and left behind makes them detectable. And there's a very good reason why. Though the water is a barrier for many land animals, some Cuban hunters are good swimmers. Of the 26 species of snake that live in Cuba, none is poisonous, but some, like the Cuban boa, of this alsophis, almost two meters in length, are sufficiently strong enough to catch and devour lizards, birds, and even rodents. The mangrove's success in colonizing is due both to its extraordinary evolutionary adaptations, making it possible to live in an acid, briny environment, and to its incredible method of reproduction. When the mangroves reproduce, they develop what will be the most astonishing means of genetic expansion. Colonizers equipped to travel vast distances, their seeds. The mangrove seeds germinate when they are still on the branches. They are shaped like arrows, and that is their first tactic. When they are sufficiently developed, they fall from the tree, and the sharp tip often sticks into the mud. In that way, a new tree has been planted and can begin to grow. Tiny roots will now emerge from the bottom, and from the top they shoot in the leaves. Little by little these new descendants grow, and the mangrove forest slowly advances into the sea. But on other occasions the seeds fall at high tide, and never gain a foothold in the muddy bottom. 
When these travelers reach the open sea, the stronger upward push of the salt water makes them float horizontally, and their green photosynthetic cells provide them with food. In this way, they can survive floating for a whole year, and so colonize other islands, other countries, or even other continents. Despite the concentrations of birds of the estuaries and the life hidden inside the dense interior, a place where the mangrove forest demonstrates its greatest biological richness is in the shadowy world of its submerged roots. Each day, the spectral world receives fresh supplies of nutrients from the rivers and the rising tides. Thus, there is constant renewal of resources in the shadowy maze of acidic muds and variable salinity, so the animals that have managed to adapt to the physical conditions proliferate in their thousands. Even apparently sterile corners teem with life. The filtering organisms such as the sea squirts, anemones, sponges and mollusks climb to the smooth roots and cover them, giving them a baroque appearance. Like many other crustaceans, this spider crab of the Macropodia genus takes advantage of the microscopic food brought by the current. Like it, thousands of tiny young fish eat their fill. The submerged world of the mangrove forest not only offers them constant food, but also provides them with protection, enabling them to rapidly seek refuge among the intricate network of holes, pores, and hollows formed by the roots. The bottoms of many of the channels of the mangrove swamp appear to be covered in strange, luxuriant plant life. Thousands of jellyfish turn over and rest with their tentacles reaching up towards the surface, filtering the water, converted into luxuriant plants of an intermediate kingdom, a living mirage in the already strange and fascinating cosmos of the mangrove forest. Down here, things take on unusual forms. Even the fish look like something quite different. The mud and the roots are the world of the batfish. Imitating the bottom, it hardly needs to swim and walks on its transformed fins, simulating an amphibian being, straight from the imagination of H.P. Lovecraft. In the minimalist world of the mangrove forest, there are also giants. Up to four meters long and weighing almost 600 kilos, the manatees are the largest mammals in the mangrove forest. Its vegetarian diet explains its nickname, the sea cow, a name which also reflects its docile character. Because in spite of their size, the manatees are Pacific animals, and that in the mangrove forest 
is very unusual.